Uh, the next session, number three, is entitled Worlds Colliding, because really that's what's happening here in Paris at Biofabricate. And we wanted to bring together a conversation around what that means for the future of the industry. And I would like to start by introducing Sarah Kent, who is the Chief Sustainability Correspondent for the Business of Fashion. Sarah has generously agreed to moderate this conversation. Anyone who knows Sarah's reporting of this space will know that she has a you know, particularly thoughtful approach to is what is being manufactured here actually better? What does it mean for the existing industry? Uh, we need to listen to all points of view. And so we respect that questioning of, of this level of innovation. So Sarah, please join us on the stage. Thank you for moderating the discussion. Thank you for having me. Sarah is going to be joined by Matt Scullin, the CEO of MicroWorks. Thanks for coming back, Matt. Matt, I'm curious to get your perspective on this because you, you've also been in the space for some time. Um, and I, th I think you know, MicroWorks is particularly interesting because you know, as, as a reporter, it was quite a, a pivotal moment in sort of understanding of how seriously the fashion industry was taking um, innovation when it emerged that Hermes, which is maybe the most traditional of luxury companies, very wedded to the leather industry, was looking at working with Mycelium, with MycoWorks. But what did it, it take to work with a company like Hermes? What is it like working with a luxury brand? So I, I took the job as CEO at MicroWorks because of Hermes and in, in a now famous meeting with Charles, which MicroWorks has a great podcast. If you haven't heard our podcast, shameless plug, sorry, you should check out our <laughs> podcast. But we talk about this story in one of the podcasts where uh, I was with Phil Ross, our founder, and we had a meeting with Charles. This was six, six and a half years ago now, long time ago. And we sort of looked at each other at the end of the meeting and said, look, for your game, I'm game vice versa. Let's see if we can make this work. And what was exciting at the time was that we all shared a vision about biomaterials being something way different, way more than just a, a replacement, than a leather. And so Hermes has been an incredible partner. We learn so much from each other, I think. We certainly learn an enormous amount from Hermes. And it's been a partnership that has required uh, a, a dedication and a patience to making something truly amazing and truly, truly different, truly new. And that has been just one flavor of partnership. That is not the culture of every brand. It's not the intent of every brand. And so the, the platform that we have with Find Mycelium that's, that's, to me, the really exciting thing about it, is that we can make things that are very new. We can make things also that are more familiar. You, if, you, if you've seen the chair that's outside at our booth, it's a fairly familiar style. Right? It's, a, it's a black, pebble, uh, milled leather. And it's great. It's soft. It's, it's an incredible material. It has its own properties relative to, say, a lambskin, a soft, a soft cowhide, something like that. But it's, uh, it's, it's one of the few different things we can do with fine mycelium. So um, I, I think that has been one of the, the interesting challenges in coming to market, but also, of course, opportunity, is that different, different brands, different potential partners see the world very differently. And the, the key is to, is to find those whose values you align with and to try to go to market in as, as focused a way possible, I think. And what does it take to come to market what, within that six-year partnership? What's, um, what's the product timeline? Well, I think you know uh, each one is a little bit different, but overall, like I like I was saying earlier, it's it's quality, it's sustainability, it's scalability, and you know quality is uh, is something that, of course, for Hermes means you know, something absolutely incredible, something new uh, and unique, and uh, with with any partnership, I think, we are, we're at the point, I think the field is at the point where you see all the materials here. 
there are a lot of awesome materials, right? The field has come so far in making incredible things. Now we're at the point where th they have to scale. And the, 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 you know, the, the communications that have been done, the intent that the field has indicated towards changing is clear. So now it has to happen, and that's going to that's be enabled with scale. So it's, we've sort of been working in the last decade towards this point of reaching scale. We're there Second. now. New challenges mm -hmm. go to market. Have you and felt something similar in where the industry is on mycelium products? Uh, yeah, 100. I, I shared a similar experience where at my last company, like, you know, I was begging people to try it, <laughs> you know, for years, for years. And this was in clean tech. And the world was talking about clean tech, but the adoption rate was incredibly slow. And I think, um, you know, you, you were asking me about this, and we, we were having a conversation once, I think the other day, about, um, you know, you were lamenting how slow the fashion luxury industry can be sometimes. I was like, this is the fastest industry I have ever worked with, right? Because this is an industry that has mechanisms of launching small batches of products to certain segments. You can do capsule collections, you can do limited editions, you can do you can do things that test, test the market, versus other sort of clean tech or hard tech industries where you're dealing with infrastructure. And you, you've got you know, big capital to deploy products or huge barriers to entry. And so uh, from the get-go as well, uh, we saw uh, just a, a huge amount of demand. Um, and I think the timing's only gotten better because the, the world demographically has shifted in favor of what everyone here at this conference is doing over the past few years. And what have you found primarily has driven that demand and is it changing? Um, I think that the, the primary driver of the demand is a, is a shift in values. I think that there, there are, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge transition that the world is going through right now between a generation that is probably around 40 to 50 years old versus younger. And as, these, as this new generation or generations, as, as they come into more disposable income and they want to participate in luxury narratives and they want to be a part of, of the, the great brands that are here in Paris and elsewhere around the world, they're looking for products that they can connect with. And this is an industry that's about storytelling. It's about emotional connection. And I think that that, that can sometimes get lost, particularly when you're coming from the supplier side when so much of what you're dealing with is, is rational, is spreadsheet driven. Can I get it on time? Can I get it for a certain cost? Does it do this, that, or the other thing? But at the end of the day, we connect with, with consumers through, through storytelling. And there's a new set of stories that consumers are looking for, and biomaterials are helping to, to plug that gap. I think this is a really interesting topic to explore further because you know we were talking earlier about being at a bit of a tipping point where we've got materials reaching a, a point where they are at scale. Yes. And so you really are having to engage with this idea of narrative and figure out what the narrative is. I want to, Matt, I want to push you a little bit on this idea that the industry is, is well positioned to pick up on new materials, because yes, you're right, it mm -hmm. can move very swiftly with capsule collections, but when you talk about scaling up and investing, you know, making those longer term investments required to build industrial facilities, and giving investors confidence in that, mm -hmm. they want to see longer term offtake commitments, right. which the industry is not so well set up to right. service. So I think two things. I mean, for us, very tactically, we have uh, sort of, maybe not pivoted, but evolved into working more on the business front directly with the tanneries. Because the tanneries are suited to doing offtake agreements. Because that's how they run their business. They take in a steady supply of raw material, and then they have to merchandise that, make different products for different brands. So, so tactically, that's one way that we've dealt with it. But I think that a, as an industry, um, you know, I'm a material scientist, uh, going back to what I studied in, in college and grad school, right, it was stuff related to semiconductors and most material scientists went into aerospace, microchips, um, defense, you know, these are industries that typically adopt new materials first. And you see carbon fiber in a fighter jet and, and F1, and then 20 years later, you see it in consumer goods. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time, we have luxury and fashion 
looking at new materials and pushing material innovation in some ways before these industries that traditionally do it. So this industry is figuring out how to adopt new materials. There are frameworks that can be borrowed from other industries, but I, I agree, and we, you know, there, there was a discussion about this in the, in the sessions yesterday about how we need to arrive as an industry at a, a, a more accepted view of, of risk. It's not just creating new materials, it's creating new structures to manage them. And actually, yeah. I want to talk quickly now that we're, we've got materials at scale, could be in front of consumers, about how you talk to shoppers about these materials and how you combat a narrative that I think is quite simplistically in many customers' minds now. Either I'm buying a product that is leather or a product that is plastic. Mm -hmm. How, how do you carve out a space for materials that are trying to be something else? Well, I, I think that we're, when it comes to communicating technical metrics, carbon footprint, things like that, um, it's, it's dangerous territory. You run the risk of just confusing consumers. And, and we believe that if you, if you present consumers with religious choices, they just won't make one. And so I think that sustainability is, is table stakes. Consumers expect that this is the shift in values that has occurred. Everyone just expects products to be sustainable and responsible at this point. So it's really up to the brands to find those materials in their supply chain or run the risk of scandal, backlash, whatever it might be, when, when their supply chains really become unearthed. And you see what's happened to fur, you see what's happened to meat, right? You know. Things are one Netflix documentary away, like chicken, right, from, from becoming nasty. And so I, I think that's a risk that we all live with today. And I think that when it comes to the amazing properties of biomaterials and what we're doing here in this room, uh, all these people, it's, it's about telling new stories. It's about finding new connections based on what these new materials can do. And that, that's the very exciting opportunity for our space, for storytelling, for, for business, for, for just the future of, of, I think, biology and, and fashion and luxury. Thank you guys so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, all. Sarah, and the panel. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Yeah. Great time.